Can I get you to introduce yourself, please? Yes, so I am Emily Sparrow and I am the Mercy Society Police and Crime Commissioner. What is the Police and Crime Commissioner for people who don't know what it is? So, the Police and Crime Commissioner is basically um, your voice, the public's voice um, in policing. They have um, a key role in setting a police and crime plan, which is basically um, a kind of your priorities for the area. So I've gone out and spoken to lots of people and got your uh, feedback and we've uh, put together the police and crime plan. I will use that plan to hold the chief constable to account as to how she is delivering on that plan and how she is working to keep the public and Merseyside safe. Um, and then as PCC, I also have um, control of the budget. So I oversee the money that comes in from um, US taxpayers, but also from central government. Um, and I monitor the budget and how the chief constable spends those uh, funds to for police the streets of Merseyside. Now, how do you stay apolitical as police commissioner, if you don't mind me asking? So to be honest, it's not an apolitical role. So, you know, I'm a, I'm a Labour and cooperative, you know, candidate. And I was elected on that basis. Um, obviously, you try and get a balance because, you know, the police fundamentally are not political. They police whoever, you know, needs to be policed across the region. So, you know, I work very closely with the police and I make sure that I don't, you know, bring party politics into my relationship with the Chief Constable and the work that I do with the police. But actually, fundamentally, I am still a political voice. Um, so I still use my role as police commissioner to to challenge the prime minister, to challenge the police minister, to to kind of you know challenge the kind of narrative around you know the lack of funding for police officers. So so while I don't bring party politics into my role working with the police specifically, I still have a political voice, and I think it's important that I use that um, to kind of get the right support and the right funding in for um, communities on Merseyside. Now. You started in a very unusual position with lockdown. How has that affected your implementation of your policies? It's been a challenge. Um, one of the, the things I really like about this role, having done the role previously as deputy, one of the things I really liked was being able to go out and speak to people, um, visit communities, visit projects, see all the kind of really good work that's being done. And obviously with um, lockdown and, and with kind of the COVID restrictions, it was much harder, I think, to get out there and speak to people um, and actually see the great stuff that's happening um, within our communities. So, um, so that was definitely a challenge. We did lots of online, you know, um, conversations. We managed to speak to loads and loads of people in terms of getting feedback around, you know, my police and crime plan priorities and um, find out about some of the challenges they're facing within their communities. But I definitely, it's not quite the same as being able to do it face to face. So I'm really glad that as things have started to kind of loosen up a bit, we are able to go out and start to see some of these things in, uh, in practice. What do you think is the biggest problem facing the Merseyside Police in the near future? So there's probably a few issues I think that Merseyside Police are going to be facing. One of which is obviously the recovery from COVID. Um, we are seeing um, challenges within the police itself in terms of police officer mental health and well-being, in terms of capacity, in terms of um, you know being able to get out back on the streets and, and, and still kind of do the job they usually do. But also, I think if you look at the communities themselves, we know that mental health has really struggled. Um, a lot of people's mental health have struggled through lockdown and through COVID. Um, and also, I think if you look at the knock-on effect of the um, funding cuts, so if you look at things like local authorities and public health and our NHS services, the kind of years of austerity that we've had has meant there is a real gap, I think, in some of the capacity that we need to support people, particularly those individuals with mental health um, needs. So I think a lot of those welfare issues end up falling back onto the police. Um, and the police do their best, you know, to me, they recognise when people are vulnerable um, and they, they work incredibly hard to be there and respond. But quite often it's not the right place for them and they're not the right people to do that. So I think trying to work with them um, local authorities and other kind of public agencies to try and make sure that support is there for those vulnerable individuals to try and reduce the pressure on the police I think is going to be a key part of the work that um, I'll be doing and working with the Chief Constable. What projects have you got coming up that you're particularly keen to press on with? So um, there's lots of stuff I want to do. Um, I think my particular passion and something I'm very keen to talk about is around support for victims and in particular tackling violence against women and girls. 
So, you know, when you look at the statistics around domestic abuse, for example, um, two women every week are murdered um, as a result of, of male violence. We know that um, we talk about serious violence and we talk about knife crime and gun crime and they are absolutely horrendous issues. But we don't talk about domestic abuse and violence against women in the same way, even though the same, if not more, people are dying as a result. And so I really want to make sure that we're doing everything we can to keep um, those victims of abuse safe, make sure that we're listening to them, we're designing the systems with them in mind, they have confidence to come to the police because they know they're going to get the right support, that we're doing enough to go after the perpetrators, either through you know training and prevention and, and work programmes and rehabilitation, or through criminal justice outcomes and getting them into court and getting them locked away if that's what needs to happen. I think we just need to be taking it really, really seriously and, and acknowledge the scale of abuse and violence there is against women out there. With all the things that are going on in the press and the media about Liverpool being a dangerous place and things, how, do you, how could you help address the misinformation that's going out? Um, it's a really good question and actually, you know, I've already been doing a, a lot of work around this over the last few weeks. Unfortunately, as you know, kind of lockdown has opened up and as our particularly our kind of city centre nighttime economy within Liverpool that started to open up again. And um, it's been great to see so many people come in to stay and enjoy everything that Liverpool has to offer. But unfortunately, we have also seen um, a spike in, in a number of incidents, particularly hate crime, for example. We know there's been a, a number of um, attacks against members of our LGBT community. Now, for the vast majority of people coming to our city, they have a great time. You know, we have a huge amount to offer. It's a really vibrant place. We know lots of people have been coming to places like Liverpool where they haven't been able to necessarily go abroad. And we really want that. We want, we want to encourage people to come here. But I think it's also important that we look at what we put in place so that if something does go wrong and if something happens, the support is there for you. So, for example, I've been working with um, lots of the LGBT community organisations, um, groups like Pride, to try and make sure that we're putting in um, safe spaces. So actually if something happens, there is somewhere you can go where you will be safe, where you will be able to seek support, where you'll be able to report to the police or not, depending on how you might feel. Uh, make sure that you're kind of looked after so that it kind of doesn't then, um, it doesn't kind of take over, you know, and doesn't make a situation, a horrible situation worse, basically. How do you think the idea on perception of the police has changed and... How do you think, as Peace Crime Commissioner, you could make a difference in making it more accessible? So I think this comes back to what my role as Police Commissioner is, and it's very much about being that public voice in policing um, and, and providing that challenge and that scrutiny of the Chief Constable and the wider, the wider police officers. Because I think, you know, the vast majority of police officers that I've met are totally committed to the work they do, they care deeply for the communities on their side, they just want to make a difference and keep people safe. And so what I want to try and do is, is demonstrate, is try and be, help the force, I guess, to be transparent around how they're making decisions, how do they make sure that they're, how do they decide where they're going to put the police resources, how they deal with individuals who maybe get things wrong, or, you know, on the other occasion where there are police officers who maybe behave inappropriately, how do we root them out and take action while making sure that we're getting the support in place and that we're, we're kind of always on a kind of a learning track for those other officers to make sure that they're doing the right thing by the people of Merseyside. I think it's about that transparency um, and about making sure the public can see how decisions are being made so they feel confident that Merseyside Police are doing everything within their power to keep them safe. Is there anything you as Police Commissioner are concerned about that needs to be addressed? Uh, in relation specifically to the police or more broadly? Broadly and to in relation to the police. Um, well I've talked about the violence against women and girls um, issue because I think that is a big issue for me that we do need to do a lot more about. I think one of my big um, kind of priorities as a broader piece of work is that victim voice um, and this probably runs throughout the whole policing system, the whole criminal justice system. So actually when a crime happens, you spend a lot of time and resource looking at the, the perpetrator, the offender and managing that and the, how they go through that system. But I don't necessarily think we always get it right for the victim. So, you know, something traumatic will have happened and it will happen to them. And quite often they then have to go through a criminal justice system. So reporting to the police or um, then going to court or dealing with the, the Crown Prosecution Service. There's lots of complicated kind of stages that you have to go through 
And I'm not sure we always get it right in terms of listening to the victim around how they process through that, putting the right support in place for them, but making sure that that, that journey is as simple and straightforward as possible. And um, so there's lots of practical things like um, working with the courts to put in um, facilities where you can pre-record evidence, for example, so you don't have to wait two years to be able to see your, your case go to trial, which is what a lot of people are having to do. And that's two years of waiting to be able to give your evidence. So pre-recording evidence, for example, allows the victim to get their point of cross and, and have that ability for evidence to be recorded at a time when it's fresh without them having to fret about it for the next two years. So it's about just looking at how we design a system where victims are very much at the heart of it and we make it as stress-free as we possibly can do. Is there anything you'd like to add to the conversation? Um, only that, you know, it's I'm just over 100 days into post, you know, I, I, it's a job that I feel really, really honoured to be able to do. I've worked quite hard over these 100 days to try and be visible and proactive, you know, I want people to see the value of this role. I know there are lots of questions around why we have a, a police commissioner and, and what, what's the point of them, and, and I think there's a real value in the work that I want to do. So I guess my kind of... My, my pledge, I guess, if you will, to the public is just I really want to be out there and be visible and I want to hear your thoughts and I want to try, make sure that feeds into the work that I'm doing. Um, so, you know, if you do have things you want to get in touch with me about, please do get in touch because I really want to be that um, kind of voice for you and, and have that two-way conversation. And if people do want to get in touch, what's the procedure? Uh, lots of different ways. Um, you can get in touch with our Twitter, which is just Merseyside PCC. You can do it via our Facebook, which is Merseyside Peace and Crime Commissioner. Um, or you can go via our website, which is uh, MerseysidePCC.info. And I think they're all there next to me, aren't they? You can see them here. And very last one. Have you got any surveys or anything coming up that people should be aware of and make a note of? So we've just completed our uh, consultations around the police and crime plan and also the um, Safe and Women survey. So we've just completed that um, and we're currently analysing it. We will be going out with some um, other volunteering opportunities. Um, so if people are interested in getting more involved, we're going to be looking for um, custody visitors who help us make sure that um, uh, detainees in custody are being well looked after. Um, so there'll be more information about that, so keep an eye out. Um, I haven't got anything else planned in terms of consultation imminently, but there will definitely be lots coming out throughout the next year or so. So I would just encourage people to keep an eye on all of our social media. Thank you, and good luck. Thank you.